So Alcaptonuria, which we shorten to AKU because Alcaptonuria is quite hard to pronounce, is a very rare genetic disease and it was identified more than 100 years ago in 1901 in London. A doctor who was called Dr Archibald Garrod identified it as, as what he called an inborn error of metabolism. So in a way, AKU is really the birth of metabolic medicine and since then hundreds if not thousands of metabolic diseases have been discovered and AKU was the first. In a way it can also be called the first genetic disease because it was the first disease to be seen to have kind of inherited genetic properties. And really AKU is caused by a missing enzyme and the fact that this certain enzyme is missing means that patients with AKU cannot break down a substance that's called homogentisic acid, or HGA for short. And this HGA accumulates at 2,000 times the normal rate and starts to bind to cartilage and bone, oxidizes and then goes black. And that's why AKU is also known as black bone disease. And so then it goes black and what happens is that the cartilage and bone become kind of brittle and they start to fragment and it's an incredibly painful process. We have had patients who tell us they can feel the bone like in the knee joints grating against the bone, you know, like absolute agony as though there were nails between their joints, you know. Um, and, and so it's an incredibly painful disease but also a disease that evolves over a certain amount of time. So children of AKU, for instance, my two sons, who both have AKU, um, don't really have any symptoms. Um, the only symptoms they have is their urine will go black on standing, and this is because of the HGA in the urine, which oxidises in contact with air. But otherwise, they don't really have any symptoms. And it's only when people get into their 20s, 30s or 40s, a bit younger for men, a bit older for women, that they will start to have pretty significant um, joint problems, so they might have their hips start aching, elbows, um, you know, their shoulders, um, but also the spine. The spine is often very badly damaged, and often what starts to happen is the spine starts to fuse into one block. It's a very painful process. And then what happens is that the spiral of degradation continues, and the joints become worse and worse, and as it fragments inside, you know, they really start to fall apart. And not just the joints, but patients also have um, problems with the heart, they have problems also with the kidneys, prostate, they start having black spots in the eyes, the ears start to go blue-black, you know, very intense pain, and it's a kind of a, a disease that affects really the whole of the body. So whilst it doesn't really reduce the lifespan much, it does very seriously um, render patients disabled. And we have patients who in their late 20s, early 30s are already starting to come to disability benefits Often, in, definitely often in their 40s, just at the prime of life, you know, they see really their whole careers and also their family situations become increasingly difficult. And one of the key things to remember is because AKU is so rare, it is difficult to get, research, uh, to get funding. However, what we've managed to prove is that AKU is an extreme form of a very common disease called osteoarthritis. And this is very important because what it means and what we know is that the study of rare diseases helps us understand and find treatments for common diseases. So by donating to the AKU Society, people will not just help AKU, but may very well be helping osteoarthritis too. And so that's why we exist as a patient society. We're the AKU Society, and we were set up in 2003 in Liverpool by a patient called, uh, called Robert Gregory and a doctor called Dr Raganath. And both of them realised that nothing really was being done about AKU and that it was time to kind of kickstart a patient movement that would start to significantly change things. And that's what they did. And so what we've really managed to do over the years since then is to build a very strong team in Liverpool. You know, Dr Ranganath is a consultant in metabolic medicine there. But we've also um, brought on board um, a leading scientist called Professor Jim Gallagher and other scientists such as Dr Jonathan Jarvis, Dr Andrew Preston and Dr Don Williams. Um, looking very much at the basic science of AKU, we've also funded a PhD programme there. Our star student, um, Adam Taylor, recently became Dr Adam Taylor because of some groundbreaking research into the kind of cellular models of AKU. And so we now have in Liverpool a programme that goes from the most basic science at the molecular level all the way to the most clinical science, which is kind of patient-facing. 
And so we built a very strong team there with clinical statisticians to kind of start designing clinical trials with rheumatologists, with surgeons to get a very good understanding of AKU and to start designing trials for a treatment. AQU is a very rare disease with a prevalence of two in one million. It is also an autosomal recessive genetic disorder, meaning that both parents must have at least one mutated HGD gene, the culprit gene causing AQU. Thus, both parents are so-called carriers or AQU patients themselves. Now, the affected AQU child has obtained two mutated genes, one from each parent. The chances of this occurring are one in three if both parents are carriers. In the healthy child, each of the two chromosomes contains a DNA molecule with an intact HGD gene. The HGD gene, in turn, produces an HGD protein. However, the HGD enzyme requires six HGD proteins, so-called HGD subunits. Three HGD subunits form a disc called a trimer, and the resultant two trimers assemble to form a hexama to yield the bioactive HGD enzyme. Only this bioactive HGD enzyme is able to convert HGA at its active site with the aid of iron 2 iron 2 malilacetoacetate acetate MAA. A mutation of the HGD gene causes alterations of the HGD protein structure. There are over 100 known HGD mutations. Here we show a mutation that interferes with the trimer formation so that the hexama structure cannot be formed. Thus, the HGD enzyme is inactive. This is called HGD deficiency. Consequently, tyrosine and its immediate derivatives are converted to HGA in cells such as the liver cells, yet HGA is no longer converted to MAA. This leads to an accumulation of HGA molecules within the cell that subsequently cross the cell membrane and finally get into the blood circulation. From there, they are filtrated at the kidney and eventually excreted out of the body into the urine. However, HGA is readily oxidized by the oxygen from the air or by the addition of an alkaline solution to yield benzoquinone acetic acid, BQA. This causes the urine to turn black, which is the first symptom of AQU. So, for the first three decades, most patients are asymptomatic. In other words, they just have this strange urine. Nevertheless, not all HGA is excreted. Some of it is deposited in its oxidized form, BQA, at the connective tissue, such as cartilage. However, BQA is chemically very reactive and polymerizes in other words, several BQA molecules join together to form a long chain. In addition to this, other unknown molecules attach themselves to this chain to yield the ochronotic pigment. Once ochronotic pigment is formed, it is taken up by a cartilage cell called a chondrocyte that lies at the boundary to deeper cartilage and subchondral bone. As soon as a chondrocyte absorbs pigment, it sends out signals to other chondrocytes to absorb pigment too. Furthermore, ochronotic pigments are taken up by osteoclasts, bone bulldozer cells, resulting in the loss of subchondral bone tissue. Thus, cartilage lies on top of spongy bone tissue. In addition, the ochronotic pigment also forms a deposit on collagen, a long molecule forming a network between chondrocytes, giving cartilage its structural stability as well as its elasticity. Eventually, all of the cartilage becomes black and brittle. Moreover, osteoclasts send signals to immune cells called macrophages 
that engulf the acronotic pigments, causing them to be shed off. This is an example of a microscopic image showing a chondrocyte with an ochronotic pigment. The next picture illustrates an ochronotic elbow joint in its final stage. Usually the only solution to overcome this process is joint replacement. Nevertheless, the first joint symptoms are back pain due to loss of vertebral joint space at the third to fourth decade, eventually leading to a total loss of joint space. However, other organs are also affected, such as tendons, ligaments and muscles. Kidney and prostrate stones develop at the sixth decade. There is pigmentation of the eye and ear from the fourth decade onwards, as well as of the heart valve from the sixth decade. Now this is very depressing. So what can you do if you have AQU? The answer is to move to improve. To me, sport is the best medicine against my aku pain. Before I started joining the um, swimming classes with the Rheuma Liga in Halle, I had to take one to two NSAID um, painkillers every day to cope with daily life. I had um, problems sitting and standing. I had a, a, a thoracic segmental syndrome, meaning that my vertebra at the chest um, got jammed and standing sitting was very very painful. I also had um, problems with my knee as my um, anterior crucial ligament of my left knee spontaneously ruptured about 10 years ago. On top of that I had um, shoulder problems um, due to impingement and bursitis. So while I could dance as everybody on the table I had problems pouring a cup of coffee or phoning and above all I had trouble pipetting a major task as a biochemist. Now when I first consulted my orthopedic because of my joint problems, he said I must do much more sport. And he also found out that I was hypermobile, so he also recommended me to go to the gym. So I joined the um, swimming class with the Rheuma Liga in Halle, and I also joined um, gym. And now I do twice a week um, gym exercises and I go three times swimming. Most of the exercises I learned from Micah, our dedicated swimming teacher. And um, we also have a very nice group and it helps me a lot to, um, to um, not to feel isolated um, with my joint pain because we also go um, for a cup of coffee after our swimming exercises. Now, um, I also learned to which exercise to do if I have um, pr um, joint problems. So, um, when I make an appointment with my orthopedic or physiotherapist due to a lumbago or segmental syndrome, I'm actually fine again and I feel very much embarrassed that I made, made it so urgent. Now, I also uh, participate in the clinical study in Liverpool, led by Dr. Rankinath. And when I did some um, Schauber test, they actually uh, were quite surprised that I could still reach the floor. And I told them about my sport activities, and 
I will say to them that in water I feel free like a fish, while getting up from the chair I really feel like an old lady. Liliana Wagner has outcapped an urea, and I can tell you that her outcapped urea at the present time is quite mild. Like a lot of women, her features of outcapped urea at the moment are slight. She doesn't have much in the way of joint involvement at present. You may know that the treatment for outcapped urea at the present time is mainly about symptom relief. We do not have a cure for outcapped urea at present. So therefore, in terms of advising people with alcaptinuria, what we are concentrating on is changing diet, changing activity. In terms of advising about activity levels in people with alcaptinuria, there's no clear evidence base. So we have to use our judgment a little in terms of what we tell people with alcaptinuria. High impact activity is probably not a good idea given that the major problem in alcaptinuria is joint disease. So therefore, any activity that doesn't cause high impact, such as swimming or water-based sport, is likely to help the joint by also maintaining muscle strength. And the way we detect that is by using a technique called the isotope bone scan. This isotope bone scan is a synthy scan that also causes the joints to light up in the scan. I can tell you that there's a new drug called nitisinone. Nitisinone decreases homogentisic acid. You may know that high homogentisic acid is the cause of alcaptonuria. As a group, we are now in the beginnings of a clinical trial to see whether nitisinone can prevent the damage in alcaptonuria. We hope to have answers on this shortly. Besides and it is known, our plan is also to look at enzyme and gene therapies as treatments for alcaptinuria, and our collaborative groups are helping with this. Myself and my close colleague, Professor Jim Gallagher, have supported a PhD student who has helped us understand the mechanisms of joint damage in alcaptinuria are much better. We have now just completed successful pathophysiological studies into mechanisms of joint damage in alcaptinuria. This was largely due to our PhD student, Adam Taylor, who managed to successfully complete these studies. I can honestly say we believe in the next five to 10 years, we'll have a cure for alcaptinuria. I believe that patients with alcaptinuria can look forward to a really bright future.